Welcome back to Media 7, where I'm talking about reporting the tsunami with Lisa Owen, Adrian Stevenon and Leilani Mamosia. Reporters from around the Pacific landed in Samoa to cover the destruction and the human tragedy that followed the waves. But how was it on the ground? How were they received? We sent Hamish Coleman Ross to find out. Often media, in the, in, when there are tragedies, are shunned and spurned and told to piss off. Here, people have been quite keen to have us around if we show some um, empathy or maybe some sensitivity. And to be honest, I think we've been welcomed here. Oh look, I think at times it's probably been quite overwhelming from them to have all these parlangis come into Samoa with cameras and notepads and satellite dishes and laptop computers. But overall, I haven't come across one person or one family who hasn't wanted to tell me their story. And I believe, as a journalist, that having them tell me the story, even though I'm a stranger, in some way might help them emotionally with what they've got to deal with. And it also helps raise their plight to the international public. Oh, it's just the immense sadness. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. So, you know, you got to, I just think you've got to be human. And the important thing is you're very respectful. You say you don't have to do this, but um, you know if, if you want to tell your story, please do. And I haven't been turned down by anyone. They've been amazing. I don't know if we're helping or not. I think we are. I mean, otherwise, if people don't know about it, the help won't get here. You know, and families won't know. You know, I think it's not till you see the devastation. That's the thing that um, got explained to me from one of the family guys who. Ben told for he lost eight of his family. He thanked us yesterday for the work we're doing. He said people have been ringing him. They said they heard what happened. They heard what happened. It's not till they saw it that they understood the level of the devastation, and and that's what got them off their bum and, and started doing something. I think we have a very important role to illustrate to the world what the situation is here, what is happening, to show them how much help and how much aid is needed here. You, you know, pictures. Uh, speak a lot of, you know, volumes. I think the media has done a lot, the media has done uh, some more a great favour of um, engaging a lot of support services from overseas. Mm. I don't think I was fully prepared really for the sheer horror of that site. I think it remains to be seen really if people can at home comprehend the sheer size that, of, of this disaster on such a small economy. We as journalists like to think that we've seen a lot of things, and we have, but we've often never lived what these people have lived, and that is what we try to capture for other people, but we can never be in their shoes, and uh, I think that's where we need to have a little humility so that we can capture their story in the best possible way. It is a silver lining to perhaps a very dark cloud that I've been able to come in and see how other people live and, and what their lives are about and to hopefully be able to convey that to, to other people who haven't been able to come here themselves. Those interviews by Hamish Coleman-Ross. Uh, Adrian, I, I was interested in what you said there uh, about feeling like you were helping and, and, and wanting to help. Did you, did you have that feeling much? Did, were there times when you just wanted to put down the camera and go and help? Yeah, I mean, totally. There's, you, you never stop being a Samoan. You know, even though you're a cameraman or a journalist, you know, when you're Samoan, you, you're still Samoan, you want to help. And God gave me the skills to help, you know, in the way that I can. And, you know, it may not be with a shovel, you know, I probably would have, you know, wished I was a little bit more handy with it. But, you know, you do feel like you're helping. I do. I do feel like we've helped. And so, I, you know, I, I feel happy that um, people there are happy that we were there. So... Leilani, did you come into contact with the local journalists? Because, I mean, we, we had one of them there, but they've almost been a little bit out of the picture because we didn't see them. Well, I worked very closely with uh, one of a freelancing journalists. He does a lot of work for us as well. And so that was so helpful because uh, the, the government would often say things in English and then say a different thing in Samoan. Uh, and, and also people are a little forthcoming in their own language. And so that's really helpful. And there's lo lots of information on the radio as well. Very, they've got a very good uh, radio system where they just put all that information out there and so he was able to, um, to, to give a lot of that uh, local knowledge to me as well. You, you did quite a lot of reporting on the official response and the government because you stayed there a bit longer than, than most of the journalists. 
How did that story unfold? Because I'm not sure, we heard it from your reports, but... Uh... Well, uh, on the first day, we went to the National Disaster Committee meeting, which was a huge thing, and the Prime Minister is the, is the chair of that committee. And uh, they're not... Um, they're not used to media being there and he sort of uh, asked if people would like to move that everyone sort of get the media out but uh, I think they saw the value in, in us being there for this time. Um, so we had these numbers trickling out but they, they were, you know, you got one official number and then three days later you got another one. So, um, but the, by the end of things the government really uh, realised the value of the media. I think they, um, they saw that we were getting that story out there and that the aid was coming in and also local uh, local reporters were saying oh the, the government's really glad that you guys are here because they wouldn't know what's going on otherwise that's, that's interesting <laughs> isn't it what, what was the sense you got from the people were they getting frustrated by the official response or I went out and I just wanted to make sure that they were getting aid and they were saying yeah we've, we're getting lots of food we're getting lots of clothes we're not getting enough water um, but there was uh, there was one pastor I spoke with in Saliapanga village when I went up to the back villages on the first day they'd already moved up there and he was saying there was no tsunami warning he was saying it was such a shame because the government had you know been doing all these drills uh, beforehand but when the time came, there was no warning for them, and he said it was 10 minutes from the earthquake to the time the tsunami hit, and people would have had enough time to get up to the hills, but there was just no warning. They don't want to come out and openly criticise people, but he said, yes, I, I'm a bit angry about that, and I think that's about as strong as you, you're going to get. But, um, you know, that, that, that I felt spoke volumes, that he actually did say, you, you know, lives could have been saved here. So, yeah. On the other hand, Lisa, there was <coughs> our government and our ministers, and you know the, the, the fact that Chris Carter was there was a story. The fact that Murray McCulley wasn't there was a story. The fact that John Key turned up on his way back from holiday and was accused of disaster tourism was that really relevant on the ground there? Did, were, were someone's feeling any of that? I tell you what, when John Key arrived, it was like he was the Pied Piper. I think mm -hmm. local people and Adrian. I mean, it's a good question to ask Adrian. They were appreciative of the fact that he had come to see for himself. And they were genuinely grateful for that. And the fact that he mixed with local people, he heard their stories, and you probably would have seen that they had this impromptu um, ceremony and they gave him a, a, a chiefly title. They were very pleased to see him and the thing about John Key was that he had been there in June or July of that year. So the Annandale family, Tui Annandale, who, who um, was one of the, the first people to be buried after the tsunami, he had met her and her husband. He had been to these villages before. So I suppose in his head he had a very clear picture of before and after. And I kind of think, my personal view is seeing, smelling, being there and talking to people must have made a difference to the way we as a, a country decided to handle aid. If you hadn't been there yourself, and he went, and I think that he probably had a different perspective on it as a consequence. Did you have that in your heads as a team? Because I think TVNZ would have been the biggest team there, was that, is that am I correct? Uh, yeah, combined team with yeah. Tangata yeah. and um, uh, Te, Karere. Te Karere went and there were two crews for the Paul Hobbs who you saw on that piece. He was he was also there for, for TVNZ. Um, so we had a we had a reasonable sized crew, but logistically you were travelling one and a half, two hours to the other side, the southern side, the worst affected areas. Apia was where uh, you had power and technology, although intermittent, no internet. And you forget in this modern age how you do things using um, the internet, BlackBerry, satellite, you know, even having to find something like a generator in a crisis situation when they're all up at the hospital, you know, and then someone goes and puts petrol in the um, diesel generator and it all comes to a screaming halt. You know, just dealing with those sorts of things. There was never, I think, a, a person sort of cooling their heels. You logistically were on all over the place. Did, did you have, this, have the sense that this was a story that you had to do justice to? Because that was what people were talking about back here, that, that, that you know, that, there's this bond between New Zealand and Samoa, and this was an important one for us to get right and to do justice to. I think that's true of every story where people who have lost a loved one, and particularly when you're dealing with so-called numbers, when you have someone on the television at night saying, oh, now there's 129 dead. Well, each of those individual people 
is somebody's wife, husband, brother, sister, child. They have a family who loves them, they aren't just a number, and you need to make people care about each individual person. Mm. Yeah. Adrian, do you think the media in general did do justice to this story? Because we, we discussed it, we, and we felt that I, I, it was I a pretty good I don't know, I mean, I, had, I didn't really see what other people were doing. I knew that I was proud of the work that we were putting out there, and, you know, as a Psalm 1 covering the story, You've got to get it right, you know, um, because if you don't, you know, your mum's going to tell you off, you know. <laughs> so, but you know, you just, you just know that these are these are the people that you're connected to, and you owe it to them to get it right. And that's that played heavily on my mind um, for even the story that I turned out for Tangata. That you know, it, like I said, it can't be just about death and destruction. It's got to be something about more than that. So. Mm. Did you have the same feeling, Leilani, that this was, you specially had to do justice to this one? Oh yeah, I definitely. That was in my mind the whole time. And um, when you asked Adrian if it helped being a Samoan, uh, in that sense, I think it really helped as well because you you really you felt it. And I think when you reported it, it came through that that's what you were feeling. You know, uh, and as she said about John Key, knowing what it was before and after, you knew that yourself. And this is where you went with your family. What did you learn doing this story? I imagine it's, you haven't done a story like this before, unlike Lisa, who's a, who's a war, war, you know, <laughs> who's got oh. war stories. <laughs> uh, just the importance of going out to the people and talking to them and getting their stories out there. Um, because you have to do justice to a story like this. Yeah. Yeah. So, what happens now? Because you know, you've all come home, what happens now to the reporting well, of this? Because it's far from over. We were actually talking about this today, and it's like when someone in your family dies and everybody comes for the funeral and everybody comes with the casserole, and that's in the first couple of days, and then after the funeral you find yourself all, all alone. And we were talking about whether that would happen here and what obligation New Zealand had to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we're very conscious of that. Because it's a real worry. I mean, you know, I've been talking to people today who are saying, well, they're feeling the love from New Zealand, but they're not necessarily seeing it. And they know all this aid's coming and they can sort of see the food and the tents and things like that, which is good. They're happy about that. But they're kind of, well, what's next? Like, they want to clean their village up, but they're not too sure. They haven't heard from the government yet, so they don't know how to go about it. Um, well done, all of you, actually. I think you all do a fine job, so... Thank you. And that does conclude this discussion. Thank you to Lisa Owen, Adrian Stevenon and Leilani Mamoisia. It's been, and this is quite a change of pace, quite the month for the giving and taking of offence in the media. And who better than Winston Peters to launch our news mash look at things that would have been better left unsaid and undone. Now, if there's any metaphor you should put away at least until they've buried their dead in our Pacific backyard... We need to pause and take a breather from the tsunami of immigrants. But if Winston Peters hadn't chosen to use the wrong word at the wrong time, Samoa's National Day of Remembrance no less, would he have made the evening news at all? Every bit as predictable as Peters' fans' fears of immigration is Lincoln University students get drunk. But this rabble made headlines by interpreting an Oktoberfest party as an excuse to play dress-up Nazis and Jews. I think it was not malicious in its intent, um, but it genuinely caused offence to some students. They got fined and told off. Another ill-advised dress-up episode on Australian TV's Hey Hey It's Saturday went a bit further. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Guest talent judge Harry Connick Jr. didn't respond well to this little helping of Australia's Got Problems. Man, if they turned up looking like that in the United States, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just keep it at zero. Like, hey, hey, there's no more show. Yeah. Oh. yeah. The story got global and confusing. When Bill O'Reilly and his Fox News friends go all PC... I, I don't get it. I don't know why they... If, if you wanted to mock Hoover, the Jackson 5 and Michael Jackson, just hire black actors to do it. Then you could do it. Why do you have to have white guys in blackface? I don't get that. And... Uh, Whoopi Goldberg is sympathetic. They have it with the, with the uh, indigenous, the aborigines. They have it in context with them. But they don't have this context, and they were like, we were just trying to do a tribute. Confused, you have a right to be. 
And finally, 3 News didn't seem to know what to do with this effort from Ali Akram on Murray Television's bid for rugby rights. Terakoto, 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 Kato, Haere Mai, and welcome to the Rugby World Cup final on Maori TV, brought to you by our sponsors Mastercard, Emirates, and Post Colonial Guilt. Was that dirty play? Well, the referee's gone upstairs for a decision from the Waitangi Tribunal. Put the jug on, it may be a while. We interrupt the broadcast for the following public service announcement. We at Maori Television have decided that Pakiha, it's time to talk. There are a few things that we need to get sorted out, and you won't get to see the rest of the game until we have. This week's homework question. Should the defence of satire only be available to works that are actually funny or clever? Is the Maori word for try, piro, also means to break wind. This is true, I'm not making this up. I checked with the Maori Language Commission. But hey, we've got years to sort that one out. It'll be fine. Fart jokes, hilarious. After the break, the state of books in Book Month. <laughs>